Hare Krishna Maharaj, once again, please accept all our humble obeisances at your Lotus Feet, Maharaj. We are, um, if you could kindly enlighten us on the glories of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur today, that would be awesome. Whenever you're ready, Maharaj, you may take the call. Hare Krishna. <coughs> Om Gyan Timiranda Sya Gino Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmalita Mena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shumakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Dinamine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvase Sasunya Vari Pasyatya Dejatarine Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shumakti the Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Iti Namine Shri Varshavanavi Devi Daite Kripabdai Krishna Sambandha Vigyanam Daine Prabhuve Namaha Madhur Ojvama Prema Dhyan Shri Rupanuga Bhakti Da Shri Gaura Karuna Shakti Vigrahaya Namastate Namaste Gauravani Shri Murtaya Dinatarine Rupanuga Virulapa Siddhanta Dvanta Harine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Paruni Tiranda Sri Advaita Gadada Rasivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So it's a uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, speak on behalf of this glorious and most holy occasion, uh, the distant Dhitira Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj, his return to the spiritual world after performing his mission on behalf of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The life of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati is overwhelmingly amazing in philosophical teachings, the most esoteric, the most deep, the most <clears throat> poignant, the most uh, revealing <clears throat> of all of the knowledge of Vedic literature and how secular society is to be overcome and replaced with transcendental society or spiritual society. <laughs> um, there are volumes and volumes and volumes of information about him. There's also numerous volumes of information of his teachings. He's also a profuse writer. And um, um, he is the foundation by which Krishna consciousness spreads throughout the world. Because of him, Srila Prabhupada came forward and became his disciple. And on his order, took up the mission to preach in the Western countries. <laughs> Uh, many years ago, <clears throat> my one god brother of mine, his name was Rupa Vilas. He's from <clears throat> the UK, at least he's living in the UK now. Um, he has written many books on the lives of great souls, such as Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhakti Vinod Dakur, Srila Haridas Dakur, and he's done also a personal book on his life with Srila Prabhupada. And the book that he authored is entitled Ray of Vishnu. It's appropriate title for describing Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And that is somewhat intricate to understand the history that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati came into and what he and how he changed the course of history. Mm -hmm. 
and the, the changing of the course of history was first uh, endeavored or implemented by his father, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. A little bit of history, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left this world in the year 1534. And he left behind him many of his followers and disciples who continued his mission for about a hundred years after his departure. Uh, around the middle of the 1600s, things started to go in different directions. Many of the disciples, followers, and proponents of the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gradually left the world. Although there was a dearth of knowledge left in the form of books, particularly by the six Goswamis of Vrindana, uh, still, many, what we say, persons who are <clears throat> trying to take advantage of the teachings of a great soul and applying their own ideas to that in order to gain some popularity or to gain some material benefit started to arise around about 100 years after Lord Chaitanya left. And many of these persons claimed to be both followers and <clears throat> family members of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. So we had groups called the uh, Garanga Nagaris, the Nityananda Vamsas, uh, there were Saki Bedis, Jad Goswamis, uh, Baals, Owls, Sahajas, um, 13, what we would call Ah uh, Sampradayas, not Sampradayas, but Ah uh, Sampradayas. That means they try to connect themselves to the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in a unauthorized fashion and we're promoting material ideas and many of the times it was becoming even licentious <laughs> so bhakti vinod thakur in the year in the years around 1830 came across a particular book which was the life and teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu written in the Bengali language. Before then, he had been a Shakta, followers of the Shakta tradition, the energies, not directly the Supreme Lord. <clears throat> um, after reading and carefully studying the book, <clears throat> he understood that this is what is the absolute truth, the teachings, of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then from then on, he started to propagate regularly through his writings, <clears throat> through his work, through his lectures, the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But he found himself up against a lot of these Asampradayas, which had become somewhat popular amongst the local people, especially in the Bengal area. And so he found himself in conflict, not in conflict, but having to accept conflict in order to bring about truth. So many times he challenged and wrote against, preached against these Asampradayas. But many of these Asampradayas had followers. <clears throat> and so it was a great battle. In the year um, 1873, I believe it was, he started to pray seriously that, oh, my dear Lord, you know, I'm all alone trying to bring about your mission of compassion into the world as predicted by you. I need, please send me someone from your personal entourage 
to assist me in this endeavor. Little did he know that that's, that that prayer was answered in the form of his own son, who was Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And this was indicated at the time when Bhakti Vinod Thakur was living in Jagannath Puri, along with his wife. He already had four children. And uh, he, his wife was pregnant for the a fifth child, and then the child was born on February 6th, 1874, at 3.30 p.m. in Jagannath Puri. Right on the Bhakti Vinod Thakur's house, it's still there, it's on the Grand, on Grand Road, where Lord Jagannath travels for his Rathayantra. Bhakti Vinod Thakur at the time had been involved with organizing and managing the affairs of the Jagannath Puri temple. And so he was quite uh, a, a, you know, a reputable and very recognized personality. Um, at one time, he had, at one point, he had to leave Jagannath Puri to go away on business. Right around that time when he, after he left, Jagannath performed his Rathayantra according to schedule, which is always in July. And the cart went along the road. As it went along the road, it stopped right in front of the house of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Bhakti Vinod Thakur's wife, Bhagavi Devi, took the child which was at that time six months old, <clears throat> and brought it onto the Jagannath cart <clears throat> and placed the child at the feet of Lord Jagannath. After a few moments, the garland from Lord Jagannath fell from his body and circled around the child. Bhagavi Devi was quite amazed to see that, and she knew this was something significant. And so uh, when, on the, upon the return of her husband, she explained what happened. And then, of course, Bhakti Vinod Thakur could understand, yes, my prayer has been answered in the form of my child. And, he, and so then he understood that this child was came by the, by the, by the mercy of the Lord to assist him in the process of bringing Lord Chaitanya's movement back into the forefront. And uh, <clears throat> the life of Bhakti, Vinod, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he was born and, and given the name Bhimal Prashad. <laughs> um, he grew up, he was a genius. I'll just mention some of the things there, what the information we have available about his life and teachings will take days and days of lectures to go through. But we have some outstanding things that we can mention. Uh, the child at the age of four accidentally took a mango that was intended for the deity, the home deity of Bhakti Vinoda Kaur. And he ate it. Bhakti Vinod Kaur noticed that the child had acted wrongly. So in a very mild way, but making his point, he instructed, oh, you have taken the mango, which is meant for the Lord. This is not good. And so at that time, Bhimala Prashad, the son of Bhakti Vinod, he made a vow that throughout his whole life, he would never eat mangoes. Four-year-old boy, obviously innocent, but still he took it seriously that he had committed an offense to the Lord. And he vowed, and this is interesting because if you live in India or have been in India, or you know mango season is a very popular season. When mangoes come out, people, it comes out usually in May and June time. 
People buy mangoes. There's mangoes profusely available. People make mango chutney, mango drinks, mango everything. <laughs> mango lasti. Mango was used profusely during that time, and it's so sweet and so tender and juicy and tasty. But many times his followers or friends would come and bring him a mango, and he would say, I'm sorry, I'm a fender. I cannot take. And he followed that his whole life, never took any mangoes. When he was seven, his father gave him Tulsi beads, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, and the Sringa Mantra to chant. And at the age of seven, he had learned the entire Bhagavad Gita. He knew every verse by heart. And he could also recite the verses and also speak about each and every verse. In the year 1900, <clears throat> his father <clears throat> was being regularly visited by one great sage who was coming to hear Bhakti Vinod Thakur speak, and that was Gorky Shortas Babaji Maharaj, who was a complete renunciate living on the banks of the Ganges in, in a very, <clears throat> what we say, uh, what we say, what's the word? Uh, he had nothing. <laughs> all he had was the clothes on his body, and that's all. And but he was chanting all the time, complete renunciation. Um, but he would come to hear from Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So Bhakti Siddha, Bhakti Vinod Thakur mentioned that actually, in order to fulfill the goal of life, one has to accept a spiritual master. Without accepting this, the spiritual master, one cannot one cannot reach the goal of life, which is pure love for Krishna. And therefore, he instructed him. I think it is about time. He was twenty six years old. That you now accept. And therefore, I recommend you go to Guru Kishore Das Babaji Maharaj, fall at his feet, and ask him for diksha initiation. Now, Srila Bhakti Gorky Shore does Babaji Maharaj had taken a vow throughout his life never to accept any disciples. And he was fixed in that. Many times people came to him and he had refused to accept anyone. So now his father, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, was telling Bhimala, you must go and, find, and get Diksha initiation from him. So he went, fell at the feet of Bhakti Vinod uh, Gorky Shodas Babaji Maharaj and asked for initiation. Gorky Shodas Babaji Maharaj was quite firm. He says, I'm sorry, I don't accept anyone for initiation. So he went back home feeling quite despondent, told his father what happened. Father said, no, you should not accept his refusal. You should find ways to convince him to accept you as a disciple. And then he went back again, again, this time in a very humble way, falling at the feet, praying, begging for initiation. Gorky Shodas Babaji Maharaj said, well, I'll ask Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, so come back in three days. So he left. After three days, he returned, and he was eager to hear what Lord Chaitanya had said. And then he uh, asked Gorkishwar Das Babaji, did you ask Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Yes. What did he say? Well, he didn't answer. And that was, that was the final statement. So feeling very, very despondent, <laughs> he thought, without having a spiritual master, there's no purpose to human life. So therefore, let me end this human body. So he went walking, and he went to this bridge, and he was going to throw himself off the bridge and end his life, feeling that I've been refused, and this is my spiritual master. And he's not willing to accept me. 
then what is the purpose of human life? So just when he was about to, to end his life, Gorky Short says, Babaji Maharaj noted all of this and came just in time and said, actually, wait, I was just seeing how sincere you were. I wanted to test you and I can see you are qualified. Therefore, I will accept you as my one and only disciple. And he gave him the initiation, Sri Varshamanavi Devi, which is a beautiful name for Srimati Radharani. And then he preached. And around the year 1905, he went to Mayapur, stayed there for a number of years, made a vow to chant one billion, one billion names of the, of the Lord. And for nine years, he chanted the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra in a little shack, just living practically on very simple foodstuffs, roots, and some rice. He would cook the rice in a little pot, and that's what he would eat. And after nine years, it took him to complete one billion names. You can imagine how many, how much chanting that is. It's, that's on the level of Srila Haridas Thakur. Mm -hmm. um, he was preparing for his mission. <laughs> In 1915, his father and, right, a little bit later after that, about a year later, his spiritual master both left the world. Now he was feeling lost. Mm -hmm. What to do? I'm feeling all alone. How can I continue on? But then one night he had a dream. And in the dream, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the entire Panchatattva, along with his father, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, his... Uh, Spiritual master, Gorky Shordas Babaji Maharaj, all appeared to him in the dream, along with um, Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj also. They all appeared to him and said, we are with you. You will be successful. There is no worldly impediment that will, imp will, will stop your preaching of Lord Chaitanya's teachings. So take heart and preach. And he took this dream, which was more like a vision than a dream, to heart, and he became inspired. In the year 1918, he took sannyas by holding a picture of Gorky Shordas Babaji Maharaj in front of him and chanting the mantras into the sannyas out of life according to the uh, <clears throat> Principles taught by the Ramanuja, the Ramanuja Charyas, the Sri Sampradaya. And then his preaching took off. He, he started a magazine, a uh, newspaper called Sarjana Sarjan Toshini and performed many, many, many activities. In 1922, our spiritual master, Bhakti Vinoda, um, I'm sorry, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhakti, Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada came and uh, he was walking along the street with his friend Narendranath Mulik. And Narendranath said, Oh, Abai, because Prabhupada's name was Abai, I know a very saintly person. And uh, he's giving a lecture tonight at 7 p.m. We should go to hear from him. Our Prabhupada said, I know all of these sadhus. And they, you know, they don't really impress me. This Prabhupada, when he was growing up, his father would always be hosting these uh, traveling sadhus. And Prabhupada was not so much impressed by them. Uh, and so he refused, but Narendranath Mulik was very strong, and he said, as Prabhupada describes, he grabbed me by the arm and he was pulling me. Come on, we should go. So I went, and when I came, he was, he was on a rooftop, Uta Danga Junction Road, 10 Uta Danga Junction Road, Bhakti Siddhanta was sitting 
with some of his disciples, and he was giving a lecture on Chaitanya Charitamrita. Prabhupada came in along with Narendra Nath Mulik, and of course, it's customary that when you come into the presence of a saintly person, you offer respects. So our Srila Prabhupada offered his respects, and while he was bending down, Bhakti Siddhanta noted him and said, oh, you are a very intelligent young man. You should take Lord Chaitanya's teachings to the Western world. As Prabhupada describes, I was somewhat taken aback. We hadn't even formally met, and he's already given me a life mission. Uh, so I was saying, well, obviously, Lord Chaitanya's mission is important, but we can see that we are a dependent country. At that time, Prabhupada was the father of the Gandhi movement. And so he had refused his, uh, his diploma in college based on non-cooperation with the British. Prabhupada was a real Gandhian. And so he, he started to propagate, we need to get Swaraj, we need to get liberation from British rule. Bhakti Siddhanta wasn't interested in hearing any of that. He said, this rule, that rule, this political party, that political party, they all come, they all go. Lord Chaitanya's mission cannot wait. And Prabhupada later on said, I was defeated, but I was so happy to become defeated. I had met a very, very nice saintly person. And of course, that was the seed that led to the sprouting of the ISKCON movement, which is now all over the world planted by his, his divine grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and fueled by the enthusiasm, the intelligence, and the determination of his wonderful disciple, Srila Bhakti, Bhakti, Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, our spiritual master and founder Acharya of the ISKCON Society. I'd like to divert my attention away from just talking now to reading some questions and answers by disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta to him and hearing his responses. Uh, this is in a particular book. I don't know if you're familiar with this particular book. It's an amazing book. I'll hold it up to the screen. You can see it. It's called the, uh, the you see the picture of Bhakti Siddhanta on the screen. Like that. It's called Prabhupada Saraswati Thakur, the life and precepts of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. It's a huge book in terms of its size. It's not very lengthy, but it's a coffee table sized book. It's huge. So I'll read one section. It has many sections describing different aspects of Bhakti Siddhanta's life and many of his uh, experiences in, in preaching Krishna consciousness. So try to bear with me. I'll try to read it slow as I can, so you can absorb the question along with the answer. Question. Everything I know is based on my experience of this world. So how will I know anything about transcend transcendence or which is transcendental? Bhakti Siddhanta, it is true that in our present state is very difficult for us to know about something which is transcendental. But it's also true that there is a way of knowing these things. If we have friends and relatives in the faraway place, then a messenger will bring us their news. Question. But the messenger does not come to everyone, does he? He said, those who are not visited by the messenger are very unfortunate. But there is one thing, and you will see that the messenger will definitely bring the news to those who are really hankering 
for this news. So he's making the point, those who really want this news of transcendence, they will receive it. Question, how will we recognize the messenger from Vaikuntha? How will we know which message is true and which is not? Bhakti Siddhanta, if my prayer is sincere, then by the mercy of the omniscient God, everything will be revealed. One who wants to be educated will only come to know an educated person by the kindness of the latter. The Supreme Lord who is in my heart will help me in every way. All I have to do is depend on him. In this world, there are two ways of gathering knowledge. One is to know things by experiencing them in this world. Another is to understand that the experience of this world is incomplete and insufficient. Therefore, to gather the knowledge which belongs to another world, we have to completely surrender ourselves to a saint who has descended from that world and hear from him. Question. Material experience is all we have. How can we give that up and surrender to something transcendental? Prabhupada. Bhakti Siddhanta. We should not be afraid of it, thinking it will be very difficult. One has to have great strength of mind to know the truth. If one wants to learn to swim, he must not be afraid of water. At the same time, one should know that full surrender or the path of exclusive surrender is not a difficult thing. In fact, it is very easy and natural for the soul. Anything which is opposed to it, that is unnatural and painful. Question. How can we have such courage? So put yourself in the position of the questionnaire as we're hearing the answers. How can we have such courage? We have to hear about the Supreme Lord from his own agent. When we hear those things, then all material experience and the inclination to make false arguments have to be locked up. When we hear about the Supreme Lord from a living sadhu who can deliver these things in a bold, lively, inspiring way, then all weakness will disappear from our hearts and we will feel a kind of courage which was never there before. And the soul's natural tendencies to surrender to the Lord will fully manifest itself. In that surrendered heart, the eternal Eternally manifested truth of the transcendental world will spontaneously reveal itself. Hmm. Uh, very important how we, how we carefully, with attention and eagerness to understand, hear from a living sadhu. When we do that, the, ten, the desire is awakened within our heart that was never there before, the desire to serve the Supreme Personality of God. Question, are the path of exclusive surrender and firm determination the two most important things for us? I'll read that question again. Are the path of exclusive surrender and firm determination the two most important things for us? Srila Prabhupada, absolutely. One should have such firm determination also to worship the Lord, saying, I must receive his grace. I must not go astray. I must always go on chanting his name. God will undoubtedly help me if I am, if I am a bona fide seeker. If one fully surrenders himself at the lotus feet of his guru, then he will definitely attain all success. The mercy of the of Sri Guru Dev, who is non-different from Srila Rupa Goswami, will be our only capital. Only that will be beneficial for us. 
but one has to surrender themselves to the spiritual master and by their mercy, that will be everything we need to reach, achieve complete auspiciousness, spiritual benefit. Question, can one worship Krishna without being under the guidance of Sri Guru Dev? Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, never. On, our only aim in life is to cultivate Krishna consciousness. This can only be done under the guidance or instructions of the devotee of Krishna. Sri Varshavanavi Devi, Sri Mati Radharani is most favored by Krishna. Worshipping her is most favorable to worshiping Krishna. No one is more favorable than Sri Radha. Those who are very dear to Sri Mati Radharani are all our spiritual masters. We, the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, are the worshippers of Krishna who belongs to Sri Mati Radharani. The Gaudiya Vaishnavas are more on the side of Radharani than on the side of Krishna. Sri Guru Dev is not different from Sri Mati Radharani. Only by getting the favor of the most favored is it possible to cultivate Krishna consciousness. When one is not under the guidance of the most favored, one will not find anything favorable for the cultivation of Krishna consciousness or for the pursuit of Krishna happiness. Instead, one will, one will find that one's heart is dominated by demoniac desires for one's own happiness. One must give up such tendencies which are unfavorable for devotion and give up all pride and arrogance. A devotee can find all, all, all opportunity to serve Krishna only when he wants to serve Krishna under the guidance of Guru Dev. But unfortunately, we have forgotten to make any effort to make Krishna happy. Instead, we have become busy in pursuit of our own happiness. Alas, instead of making Krishna the head of our household, we are acting in the role of the householder and we have become attached to our family life. But if we want what is good for us, then we have to become careful while we are alive in the human body. Otherwise, we will be deceived. We will miss our golden opportunity. So there's a little discussion uh, by Bhakti Siddhanta answering questions, culminating that ultimately the success in devotional service is to get the favor of Krishna by getting the favor of those who he is, or those who he favors. Guru Dev, being the manifestation of Srimati Radharani's mercy, can be that person who awakens within us the desire to serve Krishna in a, in a favorable and devotional way. So I thought that would be uh, very edifying for us. Um, and then uh, I'll conclude with some words of wisdom from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. And these are little, you might say, aphorisms, short sentences. Um, there's 25 of them. I don't know if I should read them all and if we have time. We want to take some time for questions. But um, I'll read some, which I think are the outstanding ones. These are penned by Bhakti Siddhanta himself. We are put to test and trial in this world. Number one, we are put to test and trial in this world. Only those who attend the kirtan of the devotees can succeed. Every spot on earth where those discourses of God are held is a place of pilgrimage. Number three, possessions of objects not related to Krishna is our main melody.
Chant the Maha Mantra loudly with attachment. This will drive away inertia, worldly evils, ghosts, and pests. Pests. That's people who are bothersome. <laughs> Pay due respects to the extroverts of the world, but do not be appreciative of their manners and conduct. They are to be shaken off from your mind. The glories of the worldly people, <laughs> give them respect for what they are, but their manners and their conducts are not very appreciated by devotees. A devotee feels the presence of God everywhere, but one averse to the Lord denies his existence everywhere. To recite the name of Sri Krishna is bhakti. You cannot appreciate transcendental matters with the reasoning of the world. It is sheer nonsense to decry them with the measuring stick of your intellect. Life is for the glorification of the topics of Sri Hari. If that is stopped, then what is the, what need is there to carry on life? Next one: physical illness with Hari Bhajan is preferred to physical fist fitness without Hari Bhajan. Our span of life on earth is short. Our life will be crowned with success if the body wears out with constant discourses from Sri Hari. Next one, unless we are devoted to God, secularism shall not leave us. Next one, look within yourself, amend yourself, rather than pry into the frailties of others. In this world of Maya, which is averse to the Lord and is full of trials and tribulations, only patience, humility, and respect for others are our friends for Hari Bhajan. When faults in others misguide you and delude you, have patience, introspect, find faults in yourself. Know that you can, others cannot harm you unless you harm yourself. And the last one is a preaching statement. I wish that every selfless, tender-hearted person within the Gaudiya math be, be willing, be prepared to shed 200 gallons of blood for the nourishment of the spiritual body of every individual of this world. So these are some statements, aphorisms, uh, things that we can meditate upon. If you want, I will be happy to send a copy of these 25 to uh, whoever you designate. Uh, that probably maybe I can send it to Shamagori since I have her contact already. And then anyone who would be interested in having these, you could read them, meditate on them, think about them, and see how it applies to you and how you can take advantage of it. Okay, so we'll stop here and. Uh, there's much more to the life of Bhakti Siddhanta. He disappeared on December 31st, 1936. I'll read his something about his disappearance, which I think is appropriate since today is his disappearance. On the morning of December 31st, 1936, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur requested Sripa B.R. Sridhar Swami to sing the bhajan Sri Rupa Manjari by Srila Narottam Das Thakur 
and Sripad Naveen Krishna Vidya Lankar to sing Nam Kirtan. Nam Kirtan is Yasamati Nandana. In the forenoon, he requested the editors of the Gaudiya magazine to see to it that the Vaishnava Manjusa, basket of Vaishnava vocabulary, would be compiled and published. In his last days, he specifically requested that his disciples form a governing body commission, GBC, of 10 to 12 devotees to manage society's affairs. You can see they had failed to carry out that instruction. There was chaos in the Gaudiya Math after he left. Everyone, some people were fighting for the position of the Charya. And ultimately, the whole society became. Uh, ineffectual in preaching Krishna consciousness because they failed to establish the governing board commission, which was one of his last requests before he departed the world. And Srila Prabhupada didn't want to make the same mistake. So in 1970, he established the GBC governing body commission. Two of his last statements were love and rapture. Both should have the same end in view. The core Naratam lived on the principles of Rupa Raghunath. It is good to follow. To all he announced, please accept my blessings to you all, present and absent. Please bear in mind our sole duty in religion is to spread and propagate service to the Lord and his devotees. Thus, the great Acharya, the Simha Guru, the uncompromising Sadhu, the Vaikuntha man, as our Srila Prabhupada once described him as the tireless preaching of the pure teachings of Lord Chaitanya, left this world other than your name of Krishna at around 5.30 a.m. on Thursday, January 1st, 1937, and entered into the pastimes of the Supreme Lord, having firmly established the foundation of a spiritual movement, which would be carried around the world by his pure servant, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder of Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj Ki Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hey Krishna Maharaj, thank you, thank you so much Maharaj for enlightening on the topic of this uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Thank you so much for sharing so many points. We are very grateful to you Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, is there anybody having any, any realization? Please go ahead. Yeah, now you all can unmute yourself, please. Thank you, you Maharaj. Also, you can also turn on your cameras, which is very nice. I can see the audience. It makes everything more personal. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Not only for these stories, Maharaj, but also the statements that you, uh, not just the statements, the question answer session. It was so interesting, Maharaj. So wonderful. If you could share the name of that book, that would be fantastic. And uh, I noticed Vinita, uh, Vinita Mataji already sent the statements to our host group. Thank you, Mataji. It was very inspirational, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Devotees, if you have any questions, you can pose your questions to Maharaj now. Everybody has become sublime, Maharaj. So, Hi, Maharaj. Krishna Maharaj. Actually, yeah, there is one question. Um, one of the instructions said we should not... Uh, there was a distinction between appreciating and paying due respects to the extroverts of this world. Can you elaborate yeah. on that, please? 
I'll read it again here. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Let me see. Pay due respects to the extroverts of the world, but do not be appreciative of their manners and, and conduct. They are to be shaken off from your mind. Yeah, so for one thing, what, what is meant by the extroverts of this world? And mm -hmm. what is meant by, you know, be appreciative? Those don't people be appreciative. that are, yeah, yeah, those people that are prominent. The ones that are out there, the ones you notice. They may be popular in different fields of society. Politicians, doctors, um, sports heroes, television and movie stars, authors, writers. Uh, philanthropists, um, people who are out there who have name and fame, give them respects because in the sense that whatever greatness a person has, even on the material level, they, that is a quality that comes from Krishna. So he said, pay due respects. That means we honor the fact that they have achieve something, but we're not interested in their, the way they conduct themselves or what they have achieved either. So he's acknowledging their greatness, but at the same time, it's, we're not interested in it, in it at the same time. Because they have nothing to offer to us. Those who are spiritually minded will find they'll look towards the the great souls that have gone before us, the acharyas, the sadhus, the saints, the spiritual masters. These will we will emulate. These will we will worship. These will we will learn from. Not the great, not the great persons of this world who are simply motivated by their own selfish interests. Although they may be, have done something wonderful by material standards, still, it's not, we're devotee. We, when we see Krishna, then we understand what is actually really wonderful. But when we see his pure devotee, then we understand this is true. This is true success. This is wonder. This is worth absorbing ourselves in, not in the uh, developed uh, talents of the, the materialists. I'm also thinking that, you know, even though such people, they um, do what they do for selfish motives, why can we not um, appreciate their, you know, accomplishment? You know, I mean, to say they, they were empowered by Krishna, after all, to be able to do what they do, you know, and maybe there is something that they accomplished that we could find useful for our own spiritual life. Well, that's a, all these accomplishments are already there within the spiritual realm. You don't have to look outside for that. It's already there. We're, we're so much connected with the external environment that we think this is the only place to, that they're, these things are there. <coughs> or because we are finding ourselves more in contact with that environment, 
this is where we notice it. But it's there also in the, in the activities of the great souls. Even their material accomplishments can be appreciated. But when we go outside and look for the mundane persons, then we start taking on, we start, we start thinking, we start to think we should emulate them in some form or another. We have nothing that we need from them. Everything is there within the within the, the realm of spirituality, within the realm of the history of our society, the history of spirituality, and the lives and teachings of the great souls are much more numerous than what we find in the material world. And that was brought out by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati in one discussion comparing the spiritual world to the material world and showing how great the material, how insignificant the material world is compared to the greatness of the spiritual world. But what you said and what is being said here is that um, that, that accomplishment that they have achieved is, is coming from Krishna. In other words, as Krishna says, uh, uh, I am the ability of all living entities. And that's true on all levels, both material and spiritual. So that much we, we can appreciate. That somehow other Krishna has benedicted them with this, what we say, ability and accomplishment. So in that sense, uh, we can see you know, how Krishna works even in the material world. The whole 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna shows the glories of the, of, the, of the activities that are great in the material world and calls that non-different than him. He is the best in all categories, both material and spiritual. So that much we can appreciate, and that's what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati is saying. But then he said, you know, but their manners and contact conduct on the personal level, we are not interested in that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Maharaj. I actually just had one other question. Um, I was wondering if you would elaborate on the statement that Guru is a manifestation of Srimati Radharani's mercy. Yeah. Well, that's can you just say something more? Yeah, that's the, if you look, you can find it in the Chaitanya Charitamrita in chapter one of Adi Lila. I believe it's verse 46 or 47. I think it's verse 47. In the purport, Srila Prabhupada makes the statement that the spiritual master is either coming from uh, the tattva of Srimati Radharani or the tattva of Lord Nityananda. Either one. So two kind two two areas where the spiritual master comes from either Nityananda Vamsa or Radharani's Vamsa, like that. It's in the purple. You can go for verse forty-seven, yeah, Adi Lila, and see if you can find it in the very in the very end of the purport. I think it's there. Uh, let me see here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see. It also mentions here the initiating spiritual is the personal manifestation of Sri Madan Mohan Vigraha, whereas the instructing spiritual master is the personal representation of Sri Govindaji. Both of these deities are worshipped in Vrindavan. Gopinath is the ultimate attraction. Go, is there any more to the purport? Go then, go to 46. I think it might be there. Uh, it's, um, let's go down the page. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Yeah.
Let me see here. It mentions, uh, keep going down the page. Here it is, there it is, in the last yeah. sentence. Yeah, I see it. The spiritual master is always considered either one of the confident socials of Sri Mati Radharani or a manifested representative of Sri Nityananda Prabhu. There it is. Okay. And you'll see there's two tattvas there, or two, two rasas. Radharani is Madhurya Ras, so some spiritual masters are connected with the Madhurya Ras, and others are with the Sakya Ras of Lord Nityananda. He is Sakya Ras. So those two Rasas are manifesting the gurus. <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering now, is it... Um... Should it be important to us whether to know whether our <laughs> diksha? <laughs> um, when Prabhupada was asked himself, you know, well, who are you in the spiritual world? Prabhupada said, that you don't require. <laughs> Another time he was asked a question again, and he said, if I told you, you'd faint. <laughs> Um, but Prabhupada did give indications in a, in a less direct way of who he was and devotees speculate on that and say he is some say he's from the Sakya Ras and some say he's from the but um, the spiritual master knows where his connection is but he, he usually doesn't reveal that. So it's generally not important for the disciple to know. <laughs> because then the disciple starts to see the spiritual master in a certain way. And that may impair his ability to understand and follow. That's why Prabhupada never revealed the actual identity or the connection with the different rasas. I wonder how it would be possible for that to impair following. Well, rather than seeing him as the your representative of the Lord who has given you guidance and instructions, you take him on the, on the level of, um, of uh, a particular mood of rasa and you may also <clears throat> you know be inclined to that mood or you may not be inclined to that mood but it doesn't really matter for you that's why it's not being revealed mm -hmm. i mean bhakti vinoda core did reveal who he was bhakti siddhanta saraswati also both of them were manjaris they were coming from the the of radharani So we find acharyas are coming from either one of those two tattvas. When Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati is mentioning Radharani here, he's also understanding that his, his particular situation is also coming from Radharani. So if a disciple um, comes to know he sees the, the spiritual master in a different way, and that could impair his following the instructions. Or, you know, thinking, well, maybe this is not my spiritual master. I need a spiritual master from another tattva. <laughs> and that would be a tremendous offense. <laughs> mm -hmm. That would destroy that disciple's whole spiritual life. And that's happened before. 
But therefore, our, our concern is his instructions. That's our main concern. Not so much his, his spiritual identity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, Mother Tiffany. Tiffany. <laughs> so good to see you. <laughs> I was really appreciating when you were reading um, the question and answers from the book. And I hope it's okay, I hope it's okay to ask if you don't mind if there was, I think it was the second or third to last where um, Maharaj uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj was speaking of um, going, you know, hearing from, a, a, I'm, I'm not, I can't remember exactly how it was worded, but maybe not necessarily a realized uh, devotee or it was really, really beautiful. Um, let's see if I wrote anything. I can look it up. Thank you so much. <laughs> let's see. You say towards the end of the... I think it was the second to last answer that he gave. Second or third to last. Mm -hmm. Well, the question, can we worship Krishna without being under the guidance of Sri Guru Dave? Is that the question? Oh, I think it may have been the one before that. I think. Uh, are the path of exclusive surrender and firm determination the two most important things for us? Mm. And what was, what was the essence of your uh, um, question? <laughs> yeah, so the essence, um, he was... Maharaj was talking about um, just how important it is to hear from um, a living son. Yes. We have to hear about the Supreme Lord from his own agent. Mm -hmm. When we hear those things, then all material experience and inclination to make full, false arguments have to be locked up, dispensed with. When we hear about the Supreme Lord from a living son who can deliver these talks in a bold, lively, inspiring way, then all weaknesses will disappear from our hearts and we will feel a kind of courage which will never be there before. And the soul's natural tendencies to surrender to the Lord will fully manifest itself. Yes. In that surrendered heart, the eternally manifested truth of the transcendental world will spontaneously reveal itself. Mm, thank you so much, Maharaj, for reading that again. That's so beautiful, so beautiful, and such an important instruction. Yeah, we have to hear from self-realized soul, mm. living sadhu. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Krishna Maharaj. I wonder what it means. I have a feeling I know what it means, but I wonder what it means if you do hear from such self-realized souls, but that spontaneous um, inspiration or something doesn't seem to follow. Awaken. Yeah, awaken. Yeah, it does. If you're actually hearing, it will work. What is that hearing? And one is eager to know and eager to follow. Questions for the sake of questions are not really considered to be uh, within the realm of spiritual success. In other words, people question just because they want to ask a question. And that's sometimes 
The only benefit from that is it inspires someone else to ask a question who may be, may be more sincere. So our question should be in line with our desire to, may, uh, to move forward in spiritual life. What can I learn that I can take on? What can I learn that I can leave behind? <laughs> And these are the, these these questions should fit into these categories. And then yes. we'll make then we'll make progress. Mm -hmm. Yes, here but the willingness to apply what you hear basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We all struggle with some something in our devotional life. But if we just push it to the side and don't try to overcome it or don't want to learn more, we think we have enough knowledge, then uh, we'll stagnate in our spiritual life. Stagnation will come because the eagerness which is the foundation for advancement is not there. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you. But keep chanting, keep reading the books. Take the opportunity to associate with devotees, and this will bring inspiration to want to make advancement. If we don't associate or don't have sufficiently associate, don't read or don't take our chanting seriously, we'll just become very routine. And then being very routine, we really don't look forward to the activities of devotional service. We just perform them. Spiritual life is on all levels of the living entity's nature. It's not just intellectual, it's emotional, it's enthusiastical, it is uh, grateful, appreciative. There's so many levels that spiritual life, spiritual knowledge, and spiritual association uh, uh, impacts us on all levels of our existence, even on the physical level. So, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was a a person who would look for opportunities to challenge people's material attachments. And that would make them think some people would be maybe a little bit taken aback. Others would sometimes feel it's unnecessary but many times those who are sincere really appreciate it oh yeah he's he's showing me where my attachments are sadhu means to cut cut the knot of material attachments and retie that knot at the lotus feet of krishna A sadhu is your best friend, but he's not a person who patronizes all your likings and, you know, there are gurus like that. Oh, you are so nice. You are so fine. Everything is about you is wonderful. Therefore, just take this mantra and everything will be nice here and just send your donation into post office box uh, 000000. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> there's there's thousands of those gurus in the world. Only those who want to go, who actually want Krishna, will uh, come to accept that what I, where I am is not where I want to be. <laughs> I want to go farther, closer to Krishna. That was Bhakti Siddhanta. I mean, he was preaching so heavy that his life was threatened. There's one story in the life of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. I didn't tell this one, but it's interesting. It should be told. The, some, uh, some Babaji's and others, they got together and they they collected a large amount of money and they came to one police officer and said, uh, we want to take some action against Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So please do not take action against us in here. And they offered him then 25,000 rupees. Now, in those days, a rupee was equivalent to a dollar maybe maybe even more it's not like the rupees now that was like twenty five thousand dollars and more they wanted to they wanted to uh they wanted to kill bhakti siddhanta saraswati and they, they they gave money to the police and the police officer said you know we generally take such bribes and such offers but i cannot do it for a saintly person, so he refused. Then that same police officer went to Bhakti Siddhanta and told him, be careful, These, there's men out there that want to kill you. So this is how his preaching was. It was so powerful that they wanted to get rid of him. And Srila Prabhupada also said, he said, if they knew what I was saying, they would kill me. <laughs> he said that also. But they did know what he was saying, but they were figuring that Prabhupada was very old and he would leave very soon. <laughs> and uh, there, there was also talks of different threats on his life, but nothing really manifested. So the some kidney person is an enemy to the, the gross materialists who want, who'd want to do everything to keep the worldly values prominent. Okay. So when they speak, they shake up those who are attached to, to those who are strongly attached to the material world. Okay. But a devotee, he likes that. They like to hear something that will shake them up and make them think and maybe help them move forward on Krishna consciousness. One of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's statements, which I didn't read, he said, a sycophant is neither a guru or a preacher. A sycophant. A sycophant means one who lives off others. Well, I don't want to speak so strongly, then maybe my donations won't come in as the way they're coming. <laughs> <laughs> And people will not give me donations. And so I should be very nice and make sure I just speak up to a certain point and that way the bank accounts will increase. But that's not a preacher. That's simply one who is in the name of a preacher. He's a materialist, ultimately. So study the life of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. It's quite immense and i would recommend if you want to start somewhere there are three a three volume set uh, by bhakti vikash maharaj um, one of Prabhupada's disciples he took 22 years to put together these 
three volumes on the life of Bhakti Siddhanta. And it's an amazing read. And the books are quite lengthy. They are, you know, they're, they're about the size of the Srimad Bhagavatams, each book. Um, but they're worth reading. And you'll find in there uh, statements and history that you have never heard before anywhere about Bhakti Siddhanta. It's really amazing. Along with a lot of information on his disciples also, and many of the pastimes that they engaged in during their preaching work. Uh, that's a nice read. You could get everything right there in that one, in that one set. I forgot what is the overall title of the three books. Does anyone know for sure? Maybe they can post it on the chat. What is it called? I think it's a very easy. I think if you give me a moment, I can find it one second. Let's see if I can find it. Bhakti Siddhanta Vai Baba. Yeah, Bhakti Siddhanta Vai Baba. Yeah, so it's by uh, Bhakti Prakash Maharaj, who traveled throughout Bengal and other places to collect the information. He got a lot of firsthand information. It's an interesting read. Mm -hmm. Any last minute questions for Maharaj? Hare Krishna, I was just going to make a comment that I once heard that um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was Shruti Dar, that he learned everything just by hearing it once. Yeah, and that Shruti Dar is that he never forgot anything he ever heard or read in his whole life. He would spend Instead of going into the classrooms during his college days, he would go to the libraries and just read the books. Sometimes he would read all the books in the entire library. And he remembered everything he read. As it says, he was a he was a he was a Nitya Siddha. He was not part of this world. He came on a mission on behalf of Lord Chaitanya to uh, push Lord Chaitanya's movement forward. And then of course, our Srila Prabhupada came, accepted his shelter and took that, took that mission and brought it everywhere in the world. So it was Bhakti Siddhanta's idea, it was Bhakti Vinod Thakur's vision, which he prophesies as being the future that the, um, People from all the five races would be coming together and chanting Jai Sachi Nandana and having kirtan. And it was Bhakti Siddhanta who actually formulated the program and sent devotees, his disciples, to different places in the world. But he didn't tell Arshila Prabhupada where to go. And Prabhupada chose New York because his godbrothers had went to London, and they had gotten some recognition there, and there was a fanfare celebration for Ban Maharaj when he came back that he had successfully opened up Krishna consciousness there, but it was only one prominent lady who actually started a little preaching center, which later on uh, closed. And the devotees in London, they met with very prestigious people, people in the government, in parliament, and they made their impressions upon them and got some recognition as great sadhus, missionaries from India. The Prabhupada went right to the Bowery, <laughs> 26 Second Ave, where people 
for the hippies and the dropouts and the, the meth freaks and, and the potheads. <laughs> he went to those who were the most unlikely. But they had nothing to, you know, there was no, Prabhupada wasn't a threatened threat to them because they were looking for something. Whereas in, in the preaching in England, these preachers were actually showing a complete contrary lifestyle to the people in big political places. So they, not, they didn't really get any support at all. Mm -hmm. But Prabhupada went to, their, went to New York. <laughs> and as he said, my God brothers, they went to London and they failed. So let me fail in a new place if I have to fail. So he chose New York. Bhakti Siddhanta sent preachers to France, to Germany, to what is known as Myanmar now. It was Burma at the time. Many places around Europe and Asia they went, came back with practically no success. But it was Srila Prabhupada who determination and great uh, spiritual knowledge together formulated the, the worldwide movement, which was predicted by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But it was Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati that planted the seed and initiated the activity. It was Srila Prabhupada who carried it out. So these three acharyas, Bhakti Vinoka, Kaur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and Bhakti Vedanta Swami, together make up the modern uh, development of the Krishna conscious movement in the Western world. Okay, I think I have to go pretty soon because I have a, another class coming up in, in about an hour. I have to leave for that class. So in between there's lunch for Shadam. So things are getting a little tight on my side here. So I think, thank you all for coming on and hearing about Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And we thank Shama Gauri for choosing the topic. She always knows what to do. She has the right understanding of time, place, and circumstance. Well, we thank you very much. And um, we'll see you all again in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the